my name is Matt and you're watching a very special episode of Pixel Burn, a curmudgeons edition if you will, about the recent YouTube copyright kerfuffle changes copyright thing. I'll be taking a look at how and why it started, what it means for you as the average YouTube viewer and me as the average YouTube content creator and generally trying to dissect what it's all about. So grab a cup of tea or coffee and get comfy because this will probably take a while. Recently, YouTube made changes to its content ID system, an automated process for identifying copyrighted material in YouTube videos, and imposed new criteria on how multi-channel networks, or MCNs, handled the channels partnered with them. As a result, content ID has now gone on a mad spree, putting content claims on channels left, right, centre and everywhere in between for copyright violations, a significant number of which have been made fraudulently by unscrupulous third parties abusing the system. Meanwhile, all channels partnered with an MCN have now been divided into two separate yet distinct groups. Managed channels, who carry on as before and are relatively unaffected by these changes, and affiliate channels, which are once again faced with the same hurdles as regular YouTubers when it comes to monetizing their videos. People who have managed to make a reasonable living from their YouTube work now have their livelihoods jeopardized as a result. To anyone who only uses YouTube to watch funny videos of cats, I may as well have just been speaking Martian, so I'm going to try and break it down for you all, mostly for gamers among you, but also for any casual cat fancies out there, as simply as I can. Basically, I'm going to try and make this the kind of video that you could show your mum to explain everything that's going on. If your mum swears like a sailor and drinks gin by the litre. For quite some time now, ordinary folks have been able to make decent money directly from uploading videos to YouTube. To be a tad more specific, they earn money from people watching adverts that YouTube slaps on any video the uploader is selected to be monetized. For every person who views a monetized video, the uploader earns a few fractions of a smidgen of a penny, and they have to accrue at least $100 in monetized views before YouTube actually pays out. The overwhelming majority of YouTubers who monetize their videos rarely make even that modest sum. That doesn't stop them trying, however, since a video that goes viral, particularly if it's of a cat doing something either adorable or stupid, can earn its creator a nice chunk of change. But flash in the pan time wasters aren't the only way you can earn money on YouTube. If you put in the time and create regular videos that don't make people want to scoop their eyes out with a spoon and jam knitting needles into their ears, you could build yourself a regular audience and with it a consistent stream of ad revenue. When it comes to monetizing your YouTube videos, there are some basic rules you need to abide by, the most important being that you own the rights to everything shown in your video, or at the very least, have permission for the things you don't own the rights to, such as background music. Now, for something as simple as a video of a dog licking its own balls, this usually isn't much of an issue. Video games are another matter entirely, however, since almost everything in a video game is copyrighted to some extent. So, how do people legally make money off videos that feature video game content? This is usually where fair use comes into play. Fair use is a doctrine in United States copyright law which allows for limited commercial use of copyright material without the permission of the original rights holders, so long as the use is sufficiently transformative and does not supersede the original work. While in theory you could upload the entirety of the Avengers movie with your own riff track style commentary over the top of it and argue fair use, your chances of actually winning that argument are slim to none. Because even with you wittering over the top of it, your version could still be substituted for the original, which means it isn't sufficiently transformative enough. With games however, it's more of a grey area since the game's main selling point is its interactivity. So under fair use, a let's play video with obligatory commentary and optional gurning face covering up a quarter of the screen can theoretically be defended as a transformative work, particularly if the main reason people are watching it is for the personality of the person playing and not necessarily the game itself. Not to mention of course the fact that watching someone play a game is, for most games at least, nothing like playing it yourself, and no two people play a game exactly the same way. Fair use also allows the use of copyrighted material for purposes of criticism, review, to educate or inform. So things like game review shows, first impressions videos and weekly gaming news roundups are significantly easier to defend on those grounds than Let's Play videos. The problem with using fair use as a legal defence, however, is that YouTube doesn't merely abide by the law. In order to keep its ass out the fires of litigation, it actually goes well above and beyond the basic legal obligation to enforce copyright law. To do this, they use an automated video scanning tool called Content ID. Imagine for a moment YouTube is a magical circus, and all the videos on it are various animals of all shapes and sizes brought there by their owners to perform for the public. To comply with government regulations, YouTube is required to be vigilant for any stolen llamas that may be brought into the circus, and if they're not then the circus could be shut down. Thousands of animals come to the circus every day however, many of them llamas, 
and hiring staff to check them all individually is simply too expensive and would take far too long. Content ID in this case is an automated robot sentry armed with tranquilizer cannons which shoots anything vaguely resembling one of the stolen llamas in its databanks that comes within 50 feet of the circus perimeter. Content ID also patrols inside the circus, tranquilizing anything it thinks might be a cleverly disguised stolen llama, any animal randomly accused of secretly being a stolen llama, and even legitimate llamas that just happen to share some DNA with a stolen one. Suspected stolen llamas are still allowed to perform in the circus, but they're also interrogated for up to three days to properly determine whether or not they are indeed an illicit llama. Legitimate llamas are eventually released without charge. Llamas confirmed to be stolen, however, are reported to their owners, who can then charitably decide to have the llama electronically tagged and still allowed to earn money in the circus for its new owner. Alternatively, they can request any money the llama makes in a circus goes directly to them, instead of the person who illicitly bought the llama there in the first place. Finally, they can request the llama be taken out of the circus. And shot. That's content ID in a nutshell, really. A merciless llama killing death machine in whose eyes all are guilty until proven innocent. To its absolutist mechanical gaze, there's practically zero difference between an illegally uploaded episode of Game of Thrones and a fan-made Game of Thrones review video that uses clips from a publicly available season trailer. One is outright piracy, the other could be argued on grounds of fair use. But, because Content ID cannot judge a video's context, it would flag both of them as copyright violations. Any claims Content ID makes on behalf of copyright owners can be disputed, and in a majority of cases this is all that's required, which is fine if you only upload a video once in a blue moon. If you do, say, a weekly games review show that includes fair use of trailers and b-roll footage, however, and Content ID is flagging every single video you put up, well, it can be a bigger pain in the ass than Vlad the Impaler was for Soldiers of the Ottoman Empire. Around the same time that YouTube implemented Content ID, they also implemented multi-channel networks, or MCNs for short. Now this is where things get a bit more complicated in a kind of businessy way, so bear with me while I try and break it down for you. Preferably without another stupid fucking llama metaphor. Imagine that MCNs are a kind of chimera of ad agency, talent manager and, sometimes, entertainment lawyer. They're third party middlemen between YouTube, individual channels and advertisers offering various benefits to all three. Some of the biggest MCNs you may have heard of include Maker Studios, Machinima, Fullscreen and Vivo. For content creators, MCNs offered partnership, where in exchange for a percentage of any ad revenue from their videos, the content creator could enjoy certain benefits unavailable to the average YouTube user. These could include access to production and editing facilities, higher than standard revenue from ads, promotional and networking opportunities, and help with any business issues that might crop up. Like music and movies, their videos would also come under the protection of Content ID. For YouTube itself, MCNs provided another method of vetting what gets uploaded. A network would vouch that all the content put up by their partner channels wouldn't get YouTube in trouble, and in return YouTube allowed these partner channels to instantly monetize their content without being scrutinized by Content ID. For advertisers, MCNs offered to target the right ads to the right audience, although this didn't always work quite so well. To whoever thought I'd want to watch a two minute long video of someone hoovering an office in Guildford before a game trailer, what were you smoking? Where can I get some? For a while, this arrangement worked rather superbly. As the MCNs started growing, however, they began signing up anyone with a YouTube channel, even if that channel had zero subscribers, by the thousands, far too many to properly keep an eye on. Eventually, the MCN stopped bothering with anything more than a cursory look at even 1% of the content going through their network, and so more copyright violating material started to slip through the net. Which brings us to the issue facing gaming channels right now. As I mentioned earlier, this month YouTube made changes to the way Content ID works and also imposed new rules that channels partnered with an MCN must be divided into one of two categories, either managed channels or affiliate channels. For channels fortunate enough to be put in the managed category, it's business as usual. Content ID ignores them and monetization on their videos is approved instantly. Channels which have been knocked down to affiliate level on the other hand are back in the same boat as non-partnered YouTube channels. The only difference being they still pay a percentage of their ad revenue to a network. Content ID scans their monetized videos for any copyright infringing material, a process that can take up to three days in some cases, and they now have to deal with any and all copyright claims by themselves. A problem made all the more serious by a recent surge in false copyright claims from third parties abusing the system. In regards to the gaming videos, many of these claims are made by parties with no visible link whatsoever with any video game publisher or developer. An example provided here, courtesy of indie developer Mike Bethel, explains how a company called Ind Music has been putting content claims 
on any and all videos about Mike's game, Thomas Was Alone. Ind Music has also claimed videos by Gavin Dunn, aka Miracle of Sound, for the use of his own music. Yep, they claimed ad revenue from his videos, of his own music, on his own YouTube channel, on his behalf. And if that weren't absurd enough, people are having their own content flagged by Content ID for matching itself. Yes, despite presenting requisite legal documentation, contracts and other proof, the developers of No More Room in Hell have had their videos of the game flagged because, get this, YouTube says they don't have written permission from the developers of No More Room in Hell. Take a minute or two to let that sink in. As a result of these new changes, channels with audiences over a million strong are having to suddenly deal with potentially hundreds of claims, only a few of which may be legitimate, but all carrying the risk of copyright strikes and subsequent channel shutdowns. You see, each video that gets taken down for copyright violation results in a copyright strike against your channel. Strikes expire after six months, as long as you don't rack up any more in the meantime, but after three strikes your channel is immediately closed down, which is a pretty big fucking problem for people who've come to make a living from YouTube and have now been knocked down to affiliate status. This has caused some popular YouTube gaming personalities to consider other options. Not that there are many to choose from given YouTube practically has a de facto monopoly on online video content. Right now, the only alternatives are sites like Dailymotion, Vimeo, which forbids gaming footage of any kind, and Blip TV. There's also the option of hosting videos on your own site, but for people with audiences in the millions, this can be both prohibitively expensive and impractical. Another option, of course, is for them to get a proper job, a solution often touted by people deeply unhappy with their own and who want the rest of the world to be as miserable as they are. Yes, there are countless shitty, lazily made Let's Play videos clogging up YouTube, but even they require at least a modicum of effort to make. And dismissing all monetized gaming content as lazy theft does a huge disservice to people who genuinely put in a lot of time, effort, and even their own money into making high quality, original gaming content for you to enjoy for free. Another fact to consider is that the majority of games publishers and developers love YouTube gaming videos. To big AAA publishers, it's practically free advertising with the kind of grassroots authenticity you simply can't buy for any amount of money. Meanwhile, for indie developers, a positive review from a popular YouTuber can make their game a tremendous, life-changing financial success. Gaming as a whole also benefits from a plurality of voices and opinions. YouTube has enabled a whole new generation of gaming enthusiasts to have a voice within the gaming community and even the gaming industry, and to impose severe restrictions on that will ultimately do more harm than good. In the meantime, the potential consequences of all this, both for people like me who make gaming related YouTube content and you find people who presumably enjoy watching it, are pretty fucking grim. Content creators like myself are now at an increased risk of our content getting arbitrarily flagged for copyright reasons. I myself use cinematic and gameplay footage from publicly available trailers to illustrate whatever gaming news topic I might be covering. If I'm talking about the new trailer for The Witcher 3 for example, it's only reasonable to show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. Similarly, for reviewers, the inclusion of gameplay footage is vital in demonstrating evidence of any criticisms they may have. For game controls like a fat man on stilts strung out in ketamine, then viewers are best served by showing the terrible controls in action. Likewise, if a game looks visually gorgeous, it's far easier and more effective to show that to viewers than it is to simply tell them about it. For viewers like you, this means less of the quality content you want to watch. If you enjoy watching review shows, news roundups and even let's plays, there's a high probability some of your favourites could disappear or move elsewhere. Whatever happens, the best thing you can do is continue supporting the YouTubers whose content you like. If they move to another video platform, then take a moment to register an account there and subscribe to them. If they move to their own site, bookmark it and try to check in regularly. It's a big help to them and the majority of them greatly appreciate it. Finally, if you're the kind of YouTuber who uploads entire episodes of Family Guy and monetizes them, please douse yourself in petrol and throw yourself at the nearest group of smokers because you're part of the fucking problem. So there you have it. Things are still in flux, of course, and the situation could change at any time, but as it stands, that's the current situation of gaming content copyright on YouTube in a weird, deformed nutshell. That's all for this special episode of Pixel Burn, so if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. If you liked it, then please do let me know. At the very least, I hope you found it vaguely informative, educational, and somewhat tolerable. If you didn't like it, however, then you could take comfort in the fact I've spent 12 hours of my life at least for nothing. You can go now. Oh, Merry Christmas, I suppose.